September 2023 update. We are teaming up with Star Team East Village to release a photo zine of Talker Zaver LNE bomb in New York. The zine's available on our Patreon for the month of September. We're going to be sending out copies to everybody on the product tier on our Patreon. Star Team East Village also got a few copies, so if you're in New York, you can stop by their shop near Tompkins Square Park. We are also releasing a Patreon episode of No of York talking to Rebo LNE. They talk to each other about New York City graffiti, etc. We also have a Patreon episode with Cochise. Cochise is an LES local, LES legend. Him and Clayton Patterson authored the book Street Gangs of the Lower East Side. Cochise stopped by the show, talked about gangs, talked about violence, talked about his life involved in the two, talked about overcoming that getting out of prison, changing his life, and advocating for a more peaceful lifestyle. So Cochise, NOV, Nov York, and Rebo LNE, as well as Talker Zaver, Star Teamies Village Zine, available on our Patreon for September 2023. After September, it's on to something else. If you want to support the show, Patreon is the best way to do it. We got tons of interviews on there from Ichabod YME, Dessa MTA, Les YKK, amongst others as well as projects like All We Got Is Us 2, Savvy OTR, Jedi 5, Amuse 126, etc. Thank you. Enjoy the episode. Peace. Angel and Z Radio is a show brought to you by the wonderful people at Art Primo. A graffiti shop like no other that has been proudly serving the community for decades from New York to Seattle and beyond. They have everything you need and you probably need everything they have. Mops, paint, inks, sketchbooks, stickers, bags and much much more. Believe me, you will not want to miss this. Artprimo.com So yo, thank you, thank you for doing this, um, thank you for doing this, and you used to, I was listening to your interview, and uh, you know, you're known for, for, you know, Gorilla Biscuits, Hardcore Punk, uh, Straight Edge, Vegetarian, Vegan, but you used to write graffiti. (laughs) Well, when I was a kid, Everybody wrote graffiti when I was in, I grew up in Jackson Heights in Queens in New York. And it was just um, part of the gig. I think I started when I was probably like 12 in eighth grade. And um, it just went from, you know, writing, you know, st- stupid shit on the wall, whatever. And, um, and then it turned into, we started to understand and see more what was going on. I started taking the trains. And that back then it was like the glory days of, the trains were covered, the insides were covered. It was, you know, before people were scribing things or everything was just paint and, you know, unis and Marbies and fucking pilots, whatever. Everything was, you know, we used to make our own out of uh, men in speed stick and the erasers from school and all that kind of shit. But once we learned that stuff, then it was just like, okay, now we're like, we're psyched because it was, it was, and you could still, it was before they locked up spray cans and, and hardware stores. And so it was, it was kind of glory days for just always having paint and stuff. But I, um, I found, I used to draw like when I was a kid, like as a, like a little bit of an escape. And then the graffiti came in and I started to see some pieces, some throw ups. And then when I saw characters, that was a kind of a, a game changer for mm. me. Because I was like, okay, shit. And then the, um, what year did that um, Subway Art book that Henry, what's his name, Charlton? Charlton? 84. 84. Once that came out, that was a real, that was kind of a mind blower. I think we, I guess we were still into it. Me and my friend Danny and this kid who wrote Wolf, this other kid wrote Skim. It's just like, you know, neighborhood. Our neighborhood was mixed like white and Spanish and then if you went a few blocks this way it was all Spanish a few blocks that way it was all black so we were like everybody had their little area but graffiti kind of gave you the passport to go into those other areas yeah and you know or you know it it depended it depended on who you ran into it depended on what kind of sneakers you had on or what kind of pants you had on or if you were going to get your ass kicked or your shit stolen or if Mm -hmm. people heard I remember one night, me and my friend Wolf. Um, Are you yeah. talking Wolf Wolf or like a local wolf? A local wolf, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Was there was there like a famous Wolf Wolf? I mean, there's yeah, more of a famous Wolf. Yeah. He is. He was. Did he keep writing Wolf? He's from Queens, and he, did he keep going? I, I, I might have. He went to jail. 
that him? I don't know enough about Wolf's history. I don't know. But this dude wrote Wolf, and uh, he used to write um, Wolf and what the hell is this girl? He used to write his girl's name all the time, too. But it was like... Is he loud two, enough? Two, yeah, yeah, that's two, true. Two, that's two, two, like, um, these twin sisters that were real, you know, gorgeous, and he started dating one of them. And, uh, but I don't know if it's the same Wolf. His name was Lewis. I don't know. You don't know. Maybe let's just give him credit. Maybe it's Wolf. <laughs> let's hope. But we, but we said uh, we, we. I would say like, oh, I'm gonna stay at his house. He said he's gonna stay at my house, and we both like, you know, broke night, and we went to go see. Um, I think it was uh, what was the one with the camp Friday the Thirteenth with uh, Jason. Hmm. We went to go see that in like Times Square. It was like a double feature, and we just tried to stay up as late as we could in there. And just when everybody still smoked in theaters and smoked weed in theaters, and we were at, we were in Times Square and Forty Second Street, we were like I don't even know, like we were probably maybe thirteen, fourteen, and um, we got up and we were we heard about these layups and we were gonna try to find these layups and shit, and uh, we left and we had I had like this green army bag and uh, it was full of paint and it started jingling and these two other dudes got up and followed us out and they chased us through Times Square to try to get our paint. But, you like know... They were, they were writers. Yeah, well, they were, yeah, they were going to write. They were definitely writing that night with paint. I didn't, didn't stop to ask them. They were like, you know, 17, 18-year-old. Like, yeah. they were just going to fuck us up and take our paint. We had that happen in Queen Center Mall one time, too. We were just trying to, like, stay somewhere. Because we'd always go out in the winter, too, when it's cold and it's more quiet. But we couldn't stay outside. Even that night after we went and we wrote a little bit, we... We went back uh, to Queens, and we couldn't go to his house or my house, so we went to the roof of his apartment building and just laid on the roof, like, against the wall, freezing, trying to sleep before we went home. But it's just, you know, stupid kid stuff, really. What did, what did you write? I wrote Raid, R-A-D-E, and then I, I used to hang out at this park in Queens, 77th Street, 76th Street Park, but I was lived on 77th Street. And one night, um, I came down to the park, and they were like, yo, get out of here fucking these dudes came down from the Bronx he writes Raid he had a fucking gun and I was like what? I was like he could have that shit it's just you know it doesn't. I have no identity to that this is just something I, you know letters that I think I can write good you know or like at least at the time I thought I could write good <clears throat> so then once it got like sort of like that because to me it was it was the opposite of that it was like the idea of the of like you know oh we got beef we'll, we'll break dance we'll battle we'll battle graffiti we'll battle you know whatever hip you know freestyle and we'll settle it that way and once it got like about um, you know writing over each other and then getting fucking your face slashed or shot at or bro bottle broken over your head I was just like this is stupid and then my friends really escalated that in the 90s to you know where a point where I would say to them. All right, let me get this straight. Like, so he wrote his name too close to your name on a wall, and it touched it. So you guys beat the shit out of him. <laughs> and like, and they would just be like, "Yo, don't make it fucking sound stupid." I'm like, "It's fucking it's totally stupid. Like, it's it's you know a name on a wall, it's spray paint touching it, and it wasn't like real beef or whatever. And even if someone is, it's you know." I mean, look at how, you know, the, the humor and the amazing uh, legacy of, like, a, a cap or somebody like yeah. that, where it's just, like, it's just a complete, amazing, ball-busting, you know, it's it's totally the, one of the dickiest things you could do, but it's not, like, worth getting killed over or taking a murder charge for or mm -hmm. going to jail for, you know. It's, Were you just painted in Queens, or...? Yeah, I mean, we would write when we'd go downtown, but by the time we started going downtown, like to more into like punk stuff, we'd, we were kind of done with it. I think it's I, I think I was just lucky to be in New York at like a good time where, when I was into like rock and roll and like my brother was into metal and and you know classic rock and stuff, and then you know we I used to paint like. These would be these like, blue canvas binders, and I would like paint full binders for people, like with like Pink Floyd the Wall or some Van Halen or some shit, and leather jackets and denim jackets. And then that that artwork and that streets kind of stuff would turn into like graffiti, just because it was cooler and it was more underground. And I like the idea that when I, I lived across the street from this shopping center, and it was like two stories, and it was just a brick wall that was like half a block long. 
So every, you know, almost every night or every week I'd come out of my front door and there'd just be another piece on the wall from somebody. Even it was, it was even more exciting when it was somebody that wasn't from the neighborhood. Uh, or, you know, if we was one of your friends, you were like, fuck, and I didn't know he was going to come out and do that. But when it was somebody else that was good, that was really cool. Because then it felt like our area was kind of becoming a thing. Like I remember um, the BQE uh, exit ramp came right down in our neighborhood and one day we were walking over there because it was like a spot to write and scene cop to tag like it just seemed like he drove down got out of his car and just did a scene tag on like the wall closest to the exit and that was it and we were like that it was like christmas it was like holy shit scene was here he, he you know he hit this wall it was just super cool but writing in like the the city and stuff was different because um, you know, we didn't know like the areas. It was graffiti everywhere, but by the time we got into, by the time I got out of like hip hop, I was already getting into like new wave and punk. Yeah. And then that took over. And, um, you know, writing straight edge shit on the walls or X's and New York hardcore things like that. So you, so you got into, you got into graph before you got into hardcore punk. And, and oh, yeah. That was like the kind of, would, would you say that was the opening, the opening to it? I think it was the opening to underground. And it was the opening to hip hop, and it was um, the opening into a very DIY kind of a thing, you know, like early hip hop. And, you know, there's no more DIY than a boombox and a fucking piece of linoleum or a cardboard box. And then all of a sudden it just sets off like a whole thing a party, people gathering, black books, you know, people hanging out, talking to girls from different neighborhoods. And that's, I kind of talked, I think I talked about it before but it was like you know new york and i guess everything in those days there was like at least in my neighborhood there was like pretty harsh dividing lines like with like race and you didn't go you didn't just walk where the fuck you wanted like people always like say like the bronx tale scene and they're like that's bullshit that never happened like that shit happened constantly because that's how dads told their sons to you know defend their neighborhood and keep people out of their neighborhood whether it was Italian or Irish or Jewish or Spanish, black, it was across the board. That's just how it was. But I think with um, graffiti, you were able to, you know, cross those borders and get a pass as a white boy because you were you could write or you could break. Like I had a friend Chad. He wrote Chad, and he was he was kind of a triple threat. You know, he danced too, and he would he he would freestyle a little bit, and he but he could write. And, you know, he was just this, like, I think he was, like, blonde hair, like, Polish dude. But we would, like, go places, and it was cool because we could do something that brought something to the culture. Mm -hmm. Or um, we just weren't, you know, sucky at it. Or at least we did it. Even if we sucked, we got up and in our neighborhood, and people knew who we were. And we're like, you know, you do a piece on a paddle wall, and then, like, these dudes from other neighborhoods would just, they wouldn't go over it. They'd write, like, little messages next to it, and it was cool. Yeah. You felt like you know, you're a part of something. Do you think, that, how different do you think that era was? That era produced, um, spe specifically in New York, so much, uh, so much legendary things within graffiti, so much legendary things um, within, within hardcore, uh, yeah. so much legendary things within just music in general, uh, out, even outside of hardcore, and also art. And yes. a lot of movements that are still happening today stemmed from, the, this uh, grouping, this like span of years, this era of time yes. in this place, and uh, you know, you were there experiencing it all, kind of, kind of firsthand. Um, whether it be writing graph and you know experiencing these things pre, pre a bunch of stuff, seeing the trains in person or going to yeah. TVs, uh, how different do you think that time period was to the one that we're in now? Uh, I probably worlds apart. I think now. I think now it's more of a, um, I don't want to say like a, you know, just an homage to those days or a um, recapturing or dedication to those days, but um, it's sho it's kind of shocking that, for me at least, people kind of give a shit about some of the stuff that I was involved in still and put it on a certain level or like a pedestal. Because we didn't know, I'm speaking at least for myself and my close friends, we didn't know what we were doing. We were just doing. And then it turned into something later on and we had just maybe been there at the right time. 
But I mean, I think about the things I fucking miss by being just focused on like my scene or the hardcore scene, like, you know, Basquiat, Warhol, they were accessible, approachable that was in like 85, 86. Madonna was fucking hanging out. You know, like there was Fab Five Freddy was always around. There was all these amazing, talented, genius, you know, people and artists. And this was before the AIDS crisis too. So like before the AIDS crisis, New York was just everything. You know what I mean? California had the movies and had their shit, but their culture, but New York to me was the universe. And everybody came to New York because you could be a ballet dancer, a writer, an artist, you know, a free, if the freakiest shit you can get into. And you could become a roadie for youth today. <clears throat> and you could become a roadie for youth today. But I think New York was just the mel- like literally the melting pot, but also like what was that? There's that um, downtown 82, 81. 81, downtown 81. There's 50, what was it, the New York 50 that they call them? All like the tastemakers and trendsetters, like all those people. Like we were satelliting around that scene, you know, with CBs and like all those clubs. They were a little bit, they were earlier than us, 81, 82, 83, but like. Roger from Agnostic Front, Vinny Stigma, like Don Fury, Jimmy Gestapo, they all were like down with those, you know, those scenes and going to the Mud Club or Max's and Harley Flanagan and John Joseph. Like those guys were, you know, they knew the fucking Clash and the Ramones and those guys wanted to know them. It was like all accessible. And New York at that time was cool too because nobody had, excuse me, like an attitude about it. Like no one gave a fuck about your fame. It was like you either, you know, did the work, you know, you know, walk the walk, talk talk kind of thing, and or you didn't. So that's the only thing people respected. It's, I think it's still like that in a way where the streets, you know, there's like that old saying like the streets know, mm-hmm. and that's more important to me than whatever. You know yeah. what I mean? As long as the streets know that I'm legit, then that's fine with me. That's all I need. You just wrote a book that talks about a lot of these early days and leads up to yes. your first uh, venture out into America. Well, yes. And being from New York um, and leaving leaving New York and going across the United States is definitely an eye-opener in 1987. That's so that the, was the first time you left New York, right? Yeah. I went, I went to Florida with my aunt when I was a, a kid to visit like her aunt, and I don't really know if that count, counts. Not really. But, <clears throat> not really. But um, my parents never, we, you know, we didn't have uh, the means to go anywhere or do anything. So like summer for me was sitting on my stoop waiting for my dad to come home to be allowed to put the air conditioner on. That was like, and like playing handball and, and, you know, neighborhood shit, our friends, but never traveling, never a vacation, never, you know, we never went on vacation, we never traveled. So when Youth of Today um, asked me, and they were one of my fa- favorite bands, and they asked me to go on tour with them in 1987, um, because my guitar player and songwriter and co-band member Walter was in Gorilla Biscuits, he was asked to play bass for them. So it was kind of like um, a booby prize, but also a, uh, you know, we think you're cool, come with us and we'll have this sick ass summer. And I, I, fa- I find in my life saying yes at the right time is, is, has really led to some great stuff. We're always saying yes and then kind of working it out. And the power of no is also great too. Because if you don't need to do it, and if it's for someone else, uh, someone else's needs, or someone else trying to suck the marrow from your bones, yes, you could say no. No is okay, you know, or, or not that not at this time, mm-hmm. you know. Like we like we spoke over two years ago before I pre, you know, like uh, during COVID about doing this, and I was like, I don't have anything really that interesting to talk about. I mean, I can answer questions and stuff, but I I just knew we'd get to it eventually, mm-hmm. and, and here we are. So it's cool, but. Traveling across the United States, graffiti's gone, culture's gone in 87. Um, you know, you're looking at, besides New Orleans, Florida, California, Texas, a few places in, the, in between, you're looking at a country that was developed in the 50s on highways, and everything is exactly the same. Yeah. So when you would get to, a, um, you know, say, you're, you know, in Iowa, and there's a punk scene that's real 
because those kids are starving for something interesting, something different. Like we 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 would we suck like would seek out hardcore punk rock or or art or music, something different. And we were already in New York, so you can imagine how desperate shit was for other people in other places. Even if they didn't even know they were into hardcore or punk, like just like, you know, weird dudes in trench coats and shit would show up and you're like, you don't even know what you are, but you yeah, know yeah. you're not normal. Yeah. So yeah, come on in, you know. How, how old are you in 1987 when you're on this tour? I was 18. Okay. And, uh, you know, we, I felt like, 80, like 87, like I guess we got into it like in 85, 86, like where we started going to shows and like getting music buying records and going to cbs and we played shows in long island and like a few other places in albany and uh, dc you know we started to like go out in connecticut but like to us i was like fuck like is it over like were we too late like 85 86 like did we miss it because those guys you know our friends were playing since 81 and 82 and those guys would fuck with you and be like oh yeah man you know you missed a7 and you never, you know, you never played A7 and you weren't here when Minor Threat came and shit like that. So we, you know, when people would be like, oh, you guys are old school. I'm like, not really. These guys, I mean, we're old, but we're not that old school because our friends were there before us, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I was reading um, the, the PDF uh, okay. a little bit and I was reading the intro and I want to just read a little bit of it. If that's yeah, cool. yeah, of course. Please. Um, so you wrote... While writing this book, I gave myself the ability to time travel back to a different time, a different place when I was a different person, a person who was just figuring out who he was, a person who was just starting to understand the power of saying yes to things, how one decision could change the course of a person's life. I learned to take control of my life in the summer of 87. I learned to fear very little and accept the fact that me and my friends were unstoppable if we chose to do something. Um, it's, you know, there's, it's, that's not the whole intro, yeah. but you got to check out the book but um so yeah different different time period different place i hear stories about when the bad brands would tour and they would uh you know they were like vegetarian ital yeah. rastafari type thing and they would just carry huge vats of sprouted lentils or something with them yeah. because you couldn't just go and buy uh, to a health food store and buy some oh, stuff no. um you know touring that's one aspect. It's probably so different. But that's a huge aspect. I mean, I talk about it probably almost, I don't know, I'd probably say every four or five fucking days I'm talking about food. Um, and Roger helped me uh, immensely with the book and, and put an, uh, an eye on it, an outside perspective, which was, was you know amazing. But I, really, in the book, it's talking about pools, girls, shows, fights, um, and and just hours logged in the van, but also food because we were vegetarian leaning towards vegan and it was impossible and we had no money. I mean, you're talking no internet, no cell phones, giant ass roadmaps in the middle of the night, not the brightest bunch of guys in the world. And we would just, we're making our way across the country and you know, I always use the reference of, uh, you know, Blanche Dubois from Streetcar Named Desire, where it's, we often relied on the kindness of strangers, and we did every day, where people would, and that's the thing, too, people are always like, oh, people are fucked up, or people are evil, or people are this or that. It's like, I believe in humanity, man. I think people are good. I think people are helpful. I think people are loving. Not everybody, but in my life, people have helped me out in some tough times, and, you know, you see literally seven starving bald kids and people would be like what's <laughs> what's your deal man yeah. like what are you guys doing and we'd go into health food stores and we'd steal and and then they would and then they would be oh take sandwiches take soup or we have extra this or no one likes this take it you know and we would be we'd take it you know were you all vegetarian yeah and I was, there was like a gray area with, uh, you know, shellfish and, uh, and or ask for more. We talked about that in the book about like ingredients on things. But when, and when you're starving, man, it's hard to, it's hard to be um, ethical. But I didn't eat, I ate dairy still. I ate like cheese, but I never ate eggs or any like fish stuff. So I was definitely, I was this, you know, I was like this height and I, I came home, I was about 130 pounds. 
So I was I was looking rough. Yeah. But I felt I felt jacked. I felt strong. I felt ripped. I, I read the book several times, and to me, it's not a story about hardcore. I mean, it is a story about totally. hardcore, but it's a story about friendship and teenagers fucking with each other because oh. they're such close friends yes. and struggling, but the awesomest of struggles yeah. and an adventure. It's yeah. an adventure story. You could change it with a touring archery team or soccer <laughs> team or, I mean, fill in the blank. Yeah. And, you know, I, it, it's, it, it's is. what it's, it is. It's like a quest, right? And I guess it is like a quest story. That's why I, say, that's why I thought it was funny to call it a roadie's tale because I thought it was like a hobbit's tale. Like, it's just this adventure man we were just getting to mordor and coming back and california was that and we had to you know get there and get back together and that's why that together song for me today is so you know apropos because it was like that's what it was about and it was about those days and like you know no matter how and we hated each other some days you know all of us you know i annoyed the shit out of those guys and they annoyed the shit out of me and I don't give a fuck. They're like my best friends you know, still. Like I love those dudes, and there is no bond. It's like when when you see like old soldiers see each other after thirty years, or you know, dudes who like were in a foxhole together or like in Vietnam together. They just start crying and they hug each other. You know, we shared experiences that nobody, the seven of us, that could ever you know share because they weren't there and they'll never be there again because it was our experience. Like I spoke to RJ. And he was the other roadie. And like, we haven't spoken in like 15 or 20 years. And we got on the phone. It was like, we just, you know, just instantly started fucking making jokes and breaking balls and talking like it was totally normal. Like the time never even passed for us. But it, I, yeah, that's the thing. It's not really, a, it's like you just said, it's not a hardcore story. It's about adventure and about struggle. And some somebody asked me to do a um, podcast with about mental health, about on the road and I was like I don't know if I'm the right person because I don't know about my mental health really but I can definitely tell you that being on that tour made me incredibly mentally strong and I can do deal with anybody and anything and any time away in the worst situations like like right now I can just sleep on a street if I need to or like I'll crawl up around a toilet bowl and go to bed no problem catch my Z's and I'll figure out some way to make money to get food nothing nothing really bothers me yeah. I'll get bitchy about you know this or that but uh, if I have to like even going on tour now when we go on tour it's like we just fall into line we just everyone just can fall asleep wherever they are we know our jobs. We show, you know, we decide oh, sound check, no sound check. Cool. Dinner, dinner, no dinner. Cool. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Nothing, yeah. nothing can bother you because it's like you've just been through it all already. And like the best situations and the worst. And like, and then like that was the thing too. Like this was this one tour, but then we continued to do it because I don't know if you just get like crazy from it or institutionalized in that way where you want to keep traveling and want to keep having adventures. But like we went on tour in '89, and then we went to Gorilla Europe. Biscuits Gorilla Biscuits went tour in '89. So your band on tour? Yes, that was like because after we did it with Youth of Today, we were like, "Fuck yeah, we can do this 100 percent." And then Youth of Today went to Europe for the first time in '88, I think. So we we just went on their coattails, and we went in '89 to Europe, and we played nothing but squats. We were in a van oh. with two people we didn't know. They were squatters, and we that was. Fucking brutal. That journal's that journal's coming too, but that one's I got I got everything for that one too. But that was um, you know it's it's character building, yeah. you know, because you do these things. Like I hear people like whether at work or friends that I have, and like I don't want to say normal people, but normal people or civilian people that don't have to live these weird lives that we live. And they complain about shit, and they're not problems. Mm -hmm. They're they're not problems at all. They're just like, you know, first world problems. Yeah. Or like, you're making up a problem. You're making something up. You know, life's yeah. life's good. You know. Back to your '87 tour. Yes. No matter how many struggles they were, they were still good times in a sense. Oh yeah. And no matter how much you all were struggling to even get to the next city, sometimes when you did get to that city, you all were heroes. You were folklore. You were everything to those kids in a lot of those small cities because yes. you you were even as the roadie. You were still from New York. Yes, you were still in your own band. You were still like with youth today. So you had to be amazing. 
Oh, the clout was huge. And that's the that's that's kind of the thing too that I didn't really understand. Like the roadie kind of was the link between the the fans and other bands in every town. Mm. We were the bridge to get to the band. They were afraid to approach the band, but the roadies were accessible. And whether it was girls that wanted to meet the band or just dudes in harp and like other bands or just people who wanted to like meet, you know, Ray or Purcell or Mike or whatever, <clears throat> we were accessible. So we got to like kind of meet all these people and do all these things or like, you know, you show up to some city and it's like, hey, we need this. And okay, Siv, go with that guy. And now you're just in a car with some dude that you've never met before. You're in a city you've never been in and you're going to go do something, you know. So the idea of New York had, definitely New York hardcore bands had clout. We had a scene besides like L.A. and D.C., probably one of the biggest, the biggest hardcore scene, I would say. Um, a lot of bands coming out, a lot of records coming out, a lot of noise coming out of New York. And um, so, you know, when you'd show up, people had expectations. And that was the thing. Like, I was just a roadie, but I was like, I'm going to I'm gonna do the most stage dives. I'm going to dance the whole show. I, you know, I was the worst roadie ever. I would just put the shit on stage and I'd dance and sing along and do stage dives and then, like, put shit away. Something broke on stage. I was like, I don't know. Figure it out. Maybe sometimes I'd help Mike, but that was about it. But, you know, we were trying to... We were trying to bring, and we I still I still do it. That's why my lip is fucking like this. I got kicked in the face in uh, Philly a week ago. Uh, first first song because we don't do barricades, and I got kicked in the fucking mouth with my microphone and, and bleeding all over the place. And we but when we would do these shows, we would bring we want to bring a New York hardcore show. New to today want to bring a New York hardcore show to you know Washington or San so you Francisco. had to get in there and show them what it was I had to show them what's up and we still do it's like I don't want to play you know I see bands play that are air quotes punk and they have people behind these shiny you know barricades that are up to their chest 15 feet away from the band the fuck is that that's nothing I want to be part of that's nothing I want to see you know what I mean like to me it was like hardcore it was you couldn't tell who was in the band who was in the audience and it would change people would just jump up on stage grab a guitar from somebody else especially in New York it was so incestuous and that's what it, that's what you know hardcore was to me you know I'd be in a rock band you know I played fucking festivals I played my band Civ like rock shows and had the barricades it was fucking boring it's like being it's like being at practice. Mm -hmm. You got fans blowing on, you can't even break a sweat. You know what I mean? Cause it, and it's like, what the fuck are you doing? You, you're not getting anything across, you're not connecting yeah. with people, you're not touching anybody, no one's touching you, you know, there's no, no, no one else is singing, you're not letting people sing with you. Yeah. It's just rock. There's a lot of, there's a lot of energy at hardcore shows, it's like yeah. nothing else. It's like nothing else. Um, I remember one of my first hardcore shows ever, this band, uh, this band Dead End Path played, and I had been to a bunch of shows uh, that I thought were hardcore, right. but, but they were not. Uh, and I went, and I couldn't. I, it was like so impactful uh, for me seeing that in person um, when I hadn't seen it online before, and when I hadn't seen it anywhere before. And I yeah. was like, "Holy shit!" Like it's like you're kind of like you're saying like I was already writing graffiti, but it was kind of like this is like a whole other section of, of uh, underground. There's a whole other thing that exists, yeah. and like the way people, the energy of the whole room is one. Is like. You can feel there's something. You can feel there's something real here, and that you can feel that there's uh, meaning. Um, the experiences that you had uh, in in a roadie's tale. How much, like you were around Ray Capo and all those dudes. How much did that influence you in terms of like how you see the world? Because you know, like you said, the shaved heads. Uh, the the message that bands like Youth of Today or or Chromags or Agnostic Front very different from other types of music the message that they're saying um, and then you're eating vegetarian during a time period where like yeah today vegetarian super common yeah. vegan super common back then like not common it, I think the messages and like the people and the ideas it was it came because we you had to do it by yourself it wasn't like we were like rich kids who were going to start a rock band and have and had like leather pants and hairspray and cool guitars everything was you know pretty budget and that was part of the thing like definitely for the chromags and af you know they were street kids we were, we were, you know we were we were the same way they had it harder than us 
but they, it was the same kind of mentality and we understood each other from being from you know certain areas but like when you yeah like when you have seven guys who were fucking vegetarian or vegan in the 80s it was like you were a cult and you were fucking weirdos and whatever you were a cult and weirdos basically <laughs> we were we were our own little cult and little gang and and that's but but that's what we wanted we didn't want to be any part of anything that was normal or you know established or the establishment as you know it's as cliche as that is but that's what it was and i mean i remember hearing can't close, close my eyes for the first time and i took it like to another level like maybe i'm not maybe i'm not looking at things like I would say like, okay, this microphone's in front of me right now, right? But am I looking at that as a microphone? Am I looking at it right in front of me? Or am I looking at this next level, this coffee cup? Then there's a camera, then there's a wall. Like I can't see everything. I have to look at everything as an individual you know, object in this room. And this is what I kind of was trying to like figure out in my brain. Like, am I not seeing the world how I, as I could? Like I'm just seeing like, the overview but like mm. I really want to see everything for what it is and that's what we're like touring was it was just like I'm gonna get up and you know we'll wake up and live like all their song titles were like real to me because they the songs had um, you know power and they had lyrics that made sense and it really was like a little you know non-religious Bible to kind of follow in a way even they, the music videos yeah, like the, we the didn't know, like no more. Yeah, that was the worst acting ever. I was in that video, but it was that's but it's this really sick. powerful message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. with but the jackets and shit, yeah, and you know, like no yeah. no hamburgers. We had it. We were we, we filmed that. Uh, we did a photo shoot for that at the band shell down all the way on the Lower East Side. It was covering graffiti. It just looked cool, and they shot the pictures for uh, "We're Not in This Alone," their second uh, full length record there. And I remember walking back. We were walking from east to west, and someone just dropped a cinder block like off a roof and it went through the car window next to me like you know it was four feet it wasn't really that scary but it was still a fucking cinder block off a roof because we were just you know weren't supposed to be that far down like we're on avenue d or something it was like get the fuck out of here it was mm -hmm. like message heard see you later we'll run up the block now with our bleached hair and our jackets and straight edge shirts on there there's so many stories in the book <laughs> And questions I want to ask you about it to tell, but you know, in the end, people should just get the book. But there's a couple, good, yeah, no, ask good, it's fine. good, good, good ones that I think resonate. You were making up a lot of stories about what it was to live in New York, and oh yeah, really fucking with people about what New York was. Yes, one of our my favorite things, and still is just to hear a good fight story. And it could be, for, I don't care if it's a 90-year-old man or like a seven-year-old, you know, girl. Like, you, you had some beef and you guys threw hands, like, let's hear it. And that's all we would do is we went to people's houses. We, you know, we didn't, there was no hotel rooms, there was no bus. Sometimes you'd sleep in the van if you couldn't get a, a good spot. But mostly we'd sit up all night with these kids and just talk shit. And they would ask us all these crazy questions because, like you said, there's no internet. There's no cell phones. No one knows what happens except it's it's ancient. It's sitting around the fire passing down these stories. And as stories get passed down, sometimes they get better, sometimes they get worse, sometimes they get more romantic, sometimes they get more violent. But you know, we would hear stories about um, whoever, you know, a story about dudes from other cities or a story about John Joseph or Harley, and then these kids would just be like, Okay, did this really fucking happen? Did this guy really say this? Did this, re and we'd be like, yeah, like he was there, you know? And like sometimes it would just be like Mike and Mike, you know, Mike's quiet as fuck. And Mike would just be like, yeah, brother. <laughs> and that's all I'd give him, you know? And then we'd have to expand on it or like we'd, you know, make Mike tell a fight story. Or Richie had a million fight stories. He worked at a, a bar with Jimmy and they would like work the door. You know, so it's like they always had a million good stories. But sometimes we would just make stupid shit up. We like in the book we talked about it. We told them, you know, we didn't have certain restaurants. We're super strange kids. We said, yeah, it's fucked up. Uh, New York, they sell uh, ice cream with alcohol in it, and people and kids can come to shows fucking drunk. And they were like, what? Like it's so pissed. You know, this is like you know hardline strange, the yeah. beginning of hardline strange. But we were just like, you know, 
again, that's like one of those things like like straight edge to us was super important, but we never took it like that seriously when we were mad about it or if someone was drinking like 90% of our friends were on fucking dust and so can we eat every day and drunk at shows and no one cared they were our friends you know yeah. it was just like I mean we got into it because I got into it personally just because I was getting too fucked up and it was whether it was like hip hop culture or, or you know just white trash rock and roll culture like that's all we did was drink and smoke weed from when I was 12 to you know like 16 so I was just over it and uh, I got it over with because I had an older brother and his older friends and we all hung out and then it just I realized how annoying straight edge guys were to the older punks and skinheads so I was like this is perfect for me like I'm totally and I'm in like an annoying scene that annoys everybody else now we're going to be the annoying guys in this scene so it was fun you know you could just everyone just drove crazy you're in Florida and the van breaks yes <clears throat> That's an that's a that was an epic that was a quest. We had to we had to fix our van and we had to work rich well we basically had zero money. So the only way we can fix this van was to go and work in a junkyard. The skinhead band that we played with knew some guys who owned the junkyard and they were, you know, mechanics, air quotes, and they were willing to take our van and see what we did so we threw a rod we didn't know what that meant but it meant that Richie Mike Judge RJ and myself sort of volunteered to go and work in this junkyard and I think it was in July in Florida and we had to work to pay for the part that they were going to scavenge or we were going to scavenge someone had to look for the parts that we needed and then they would fix it so um, it's pretty hyper detailed in the book, but basically Mike and RJ knew how to take windows out. And after I saw how you take a window out, it took two seconds to learn how to take a window out. You put a fucking wire through the frame and you just slice out the, what the rubber that's holding the window and you pop the window out. Much cooler job. Richie and I uh, decided that we were gonna be the guys who would carry car doors for that were actually our employees for the day employers for the day decided we would carry car doors and down a hill and put them in size order against the fence while traipsing through piles of junkyard dog shit fire ant hills and we showed up to work in vans and t-shirts and shorts so sunburn dog shit fire ants bloody shoulders from carrying car doors but at the end of the day we got the van fixed and and we moved on another day. I think we were stuck in Florida for like a, almost a week between shows and broken van. But these girls took mercy on us and let us stay in their apartment. But I think I spoke about it in the book too. The four of us that went would still today be the four that went again. Because um, Walter, Ray, and Purcell, they were not, they were not the dudes who were going to volunteer to go into a junkyard and do the work. It was like the universe will provide for us somehow if it's you guys sacrificing, that's what it is, but we're going to hang out here. The Let's three of them didn't say thank you either, probably. I think it was, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know if there was an actual thank you. It might have been like, good job, guys, or laughing when we came in. Like, how, how was that? That's more of our relationship. Walk through the door covered in dog shit and sunburn, and just like Priscilla would just be laughing on the couch. How, how they had how'd it go? You know, like that kind of stuff. But... It gives you, um, you know, it's like growing up, I guess, in a household of uh, brothers, jockey brothers or ball busting brothers or, you know, um, guys who just fuck with each other nonstop. So what, one of the great things about this book is it's really visual from yes. the actual images of the original notebook, journals to photos. Um, Maps, you flyers, a lot of flyers. So, are you a hoarder? Are you a collector? Uh, both, I would say. Um, I and the weird thing is, I never, never considered myself a, a writer in any way or a journal keeper. I just knew. I think, like, I don't even have a memory of saying to myself, "You should bring a notebook." You know, you should journal this. I just did it, and I don't know if it was because I might have 
just read or was in the process of reading On the Road from Kerouac. And I, and I wasn't even a voracious reader, I was, you know, still not. I just, it was one of those things where I was like, I think I need to document this and just so I don't fucking forget. Because I definitely forget a lot of, a lot of details. <clears throat> um, and I'm so glad I had these things. It was so cool. And, and even the guys who were on the tour, when I was sending them stuff, they'd be like, oh my God, I totally forgot about that. I totally forgot about that. So it's so great that I kept it. But I do have a slight problem with like 60s, 70s G.I. Joe collecting original records and I had t-shirts, but a lot of paper, a lot of ephemera. None of the other guys on the tour were keeping a journal, were they? No. So you re you reread this, these journals to write this book. And that's yeah. kind of what it was based off of. Yeah, what I did was I had the journal, but some of the pages were like, <clears throat> you know, we went swimming today. The house sucked. That was it. And some of them were really long. So I had to go back and revisit it. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> I had to go back and revisit it and um, ask questions to like other guys that were there. Look at notes, find flyers and things online <clears throat> about the shows. And that was really kind of fun, like to go back and reread everything. <clears throat> but I think when you have a journal and it's private, like a diary, most of it is just you shit talking and venting for yourself. You know, so it was a lot of it, you had to kind of find more of the fun. Or say, <clears throat> what was this person doing that day? And what was I doing that day? And then what was and we all did together? But a lot of the fun th uh, stuff about it was like, all right, we got a flat tire going over the Mississippi, you know, uh, river. Where was that? What, you know, what bridge did we go on? And then I would figure out what, where we were, where we were driving from. And then now, you know, with your fucking computer you can look up anything and I'd be like oh shit there's the bridge like there's the picture now we have the name of the bridge picture of the bridge where it lets us out <clears throat> and it was like a little bit of like an investigation so it was fun the guys in the band at the time weren't fucking with you for having a journal <clears throat> I don't think so because I did it kind of like at night in private as my uh, like a cathartic way of like shit talking them uh, it was like my own private like little session and now it's like, fuck, that was smart, you know? And then, but the fuck, the thing I did fuck up was years later when I was doing uh, Civ tours, <clears throat> I was playing these really crazy festivals and going out with these really big bands and having all this, a lot of really good adventure stories, you know, a lot of good shit happening. But I was kind of over it by that time about like touring and being on the road because <clears throat> it wasn't fun anymore. It was like, you know, eight months out of the year. It was work. It was, you know, it was, it was a mind fuck. So I stopped journaling, but I do have uh, a few other tours like that we did the early tours because I thought those were like important to do. But yeah, I never. I don't even know if anybody even brought it up or anything. It was just like I was keeping keeping notes. It's fine. Did you find any of the people you'd <clears throat> stayed with along the way? Any of the random girls' houses or this or that while you were researching? No, I didn't get too deep uh, uh, any of that where I like looked up addresses or anything or phone numbers. Like I have all the numbers and addresses. A lot of uh, a lot of like notes written. And the funny thing is, I was texting with RJ, the other roadie, today. And he's like, oh, I saw your your um, Instagram, <clears throat> and I saw the picture of your uh, of the of the notebook where you kept like all of the uh, all of the numbers and the dates and all the shit. He sent me a picture. He had the same one, some of the same stickers on it with different like stuff. And I was like, you fucker, like you didn't send me this. And he's like, I just thought about it. He's he's the worst. He he like. He's just like, ah, I know I had it somewhere, you know? I'm like, dude, the book's done. Like, I could have used all this. <clears throat> He's like, ah, don't worry about it. You know, he doesn't care. He's, like, so removed. But it was just cool to see he had the same stuff because RJ and I, no matter what happened on this tour, we got blamed for it because we were the roadies, you know? <clears throat> so if you got lost, the things got broken, things got stolen, if we were late, we were the we were always the guys in trouble. 
How so. long after uh, after this tour did uh, did Ray go to India and kind of like stop doing Youth of Today for a while? <clears throat> I think he he was a Ray sort of starting to get into Krishna consciousness. I think in eighty seven. I think by 88 and then in 89 he was a devotee and then Purcell took a little longer he was doing judge but Ray got into it pretty early I mean it wasn't just um, Krishna consciousness if I remember I remember he went through a time where he was like reading a lot and getting into like um, being a Buddhist and <clears throat> we played this one show in Connecticut what I would say we would they play the show in Connecticut at the anthrax and he had like grown his hair out and it was like blonde and like orange and he had a beard and no one no one ever had a beard like in the 80s and he had all these giant beads on <clears throat> and they played the show and he didn't sing anything he just walked back and forth like screaming and like just raking people's faces and jumping in the crowd and like you know pulling people's heads and shaking them and the whole crowd would be singing and and we're just like kind of standing on this thing and we're like, is he having a nervous breakdown right now? Like, what's happening with Ray? Like, okay. He's just screaming and growling and slapping people and grabbing their heads. And people loved it. And it was like, all right, that's the show for today. It was like almost like watching like HR. Like in the early days, like you never, knew, you never knew what HR was going to do. Yeah. <clears throat> I've watched him come out with a football helmet on with dreads, like fake dreads glued to it and a cape. When he just stood there with his hands up and he said, peace and love over and over. And the band is just like, motherfucker. <laughs> and then I've seen him be so brilliant, so amazing, so perfect. You know. So what's the best Youth of Today song? Oh, fuck. That's a tough one. Um, I got to, right now, I really got a boner for Together. Um, I would say Expectations. That is that is as punk as it gets, and as uh, for a young person, expectations I think is a thing. For a time, for a uh, and uh, for a timeless um, anti-racism uh, anthem, break down the walls is is always you know perfectly poised. Um, God, I have a flame still burns tattoo because that reminds me to not suck and turn into, you know. So the 87 <clears throat> tour, Gorilla Biscuits are already a band. Yes. Did being on that tour make Gorilla Biscuits better? Um, <clears throat> I think it made Gorilla Biscuits know what not to do <clears throat> with each other. It made us want to perform better it made us want to want to meet made me want to be a better front man and um talk more shit and be more comfortable because i was not a comfortable front man i was not as charismatic i don't i don't think i'll ever be as a charismatic front man as ray is um he's uh, you know he's on the very short list of the the best to ever do it um but i think it made us have confidence and it made Walter and I realize, okay, we can if we do this together, like because we just did it, we can do our own thing and and just take it and run with it. But it definitely made me want to be more of a guy who has his say and can change minds and and try to move people in a direction, not as um, you know such a mass movement as like say you know. A religious leader where you know I think Capo tends to go down that road <clears throat> where um, he's uh, you know almost like a guru or a spiritual you know advisor in a way and he can um, move people in that direction I, I I just hope some things that I say or things that I stand for will sink in and even if it's not immediate will just sink in and, and make you go okay I don't have to do something I'm not happy with, I can live my life in a better way. I think they have sunk it in because you're still doing it and you're still yeah. filling rooms. I got the Start Today CD at Smash Records in Washington, D.C., probably in seventh grade. And to me, it's still one of my favorite hardcore records. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. I think, you know, Walter's a brilliant songwriter, and I think we our live shows are what is keeping us um, uh, relevant. And I think... 
we are able, but again, it goes back to not being full of shit. <clears throat> when we got into it and what made us love it was there was no barricade, there was stage diving, there was sing-alongs, there was pile-ups, there was no security. You know, we'll be our own security. Don't, you know, I don't need some fucking hired dude to protect me. You know what I mean? Like, or anybody. Or like, we know, you know, someone's gonna fucking fall into the drums. We know someone's gonna knock Walter over. We know I'm gonna get fucking knocked out. Whatever. You know what I mean? It's part of the gig. Yeah. And that's what we signed up for because we're trying to give this experience. Like, <clears throat> I talk about a uh, uh, singer for, um, what the fuck? Uh, no for an answer, Dana Mahoney in the book because we stayed with him. And a few years back, we were playing in California and Dan was like, you know, I'm not into this reunion shit and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, it's not a reunion. We, we broke up. We started playing together again at CB's in 2005. And we've been playing ever since. Like, I, don't, I just feel like we play. He's like, well, what about uh, new music? I said, dude, our record is our record and people want to hear what they know. I said, my job isn't to be like, look at me, new song. Look how brilliant we are. Check this out. It's like nothing blows a fucking good band's vibe and the show like here's a new one yeah. like those words it's like you might as well throw a fucking bomb in the audience who cares bring me back to when I was 16 and 17 and I wanted to rip the skin off my fucking face when I heard the song and just go crazy that's our job that's our that's what we're here for that's what we love like I want to bring you back to before you had the fucking kids, before your divorce, or like if you're 16, like I want you to be fucking, I want you to throw yourself off the stage because of the song, you know? And that's what I'm there for. And that's what I tried to tell Dan. You know, it's like no one, no one cares about your new shit. They care about like your good stuff and the stuff that made a difference and made a change. And that's, and I understand that and I'm cool with that. Mm -hmm. you throw on a few covers of your favorite song. <clears throat> yeah, and we, have, we know we have to fill it up a little bit. So we throw in, you know, stuff that we think we can do, do pretty good. You'll throw, you know, who doesn't like Minor Thread? Everyone knows that. And everybody in the band except me and Charlie played in Warzone. So I think we're allowed to play as many Warzone songs as we want to, you know. And Ray was a huge, Ray, Ray Bees was a huge part of all of our lives and instrumental in who we became and helping us, you know, play shows early on, just like Jimmy from Murphy's Law. And, you know... The guys in Agnostic Front, like I put up something, uh, a bootleg. We had a bootleg um, seven inch from Germany that um, I think it's from Germany, wherever. Um, but Revelation confiscated them and got them. And Roger texted me and was like, hey, can I get one of those seven inches? I have like a collection. <clears throat> and I was like, a collection of what? And he was like, GB stuff. And I was like, no, you don't. Like, you're, you know what I mean? Like He's like, yeah, dude, I got the demo tape you gave me in like 85 I, in front of CB's. Like, Roger's got a collection. Roger's a hoarder. But like, to me, that's the best thing ever that Roger has like our shit and gives a shit about it. Like, that's, that's the feather in the cap, you know? That's like mm -hmm. the coolest thing. I agree. I've, I've, let me try and talk again. I have those instances happen, you know, <clears throat> here and there where, like you're, I don't want to say a hero, but wow, now you're talking to me. Now we're friends. Like yeah. now you're asking me for something. You're asking me for this like book I did. And like, no matter how much like we can just <laughs> sit there and talk shit to each other, it's still like, you're that guy. But see, like, but see, and I feel the same way because when I came to see your show in LA, the Beastie Boys like thing you did, I didn't know what I was coming to. And <clears throat> I was, I was blown away at the... The scope of it, the taste level of it, and I don't mean to like blow smoke up your ass because you're sitting here, but like it was beautiful and visually, and those guys were our guys too. We mm -hmm. felt those were our New York guys, like BC Boys were our guys. <clears throat> and when I went there, and it was all the shit that I loved the pieces of paper, the handwritten notes, the lyrics, the road cases, the tangible, real things Stuff. that made toy stuff but you had it and you displayed it and you showed it and I don't know if everybody in the room understands how important that stuff is Not but as many I do of them. 
But that's why I approached you to help me with this because I understood that you understand visually what I understand and you would be an outside person that I, you would you would be able to look at this the way I want people to look at it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. <clears throat> so that's why, that's why I was so happy that you said yes. I was like, okay, this isn't like, you know, a uh, fucking knucklehead that's going to be like, yeah, dude, it's good. Yeah, yeah. You but we, that's what I want to do. Like, I've learned <laughs> as you have so much of what we're in you of doing this podcast. Like, I'm learned by trial and error and yeah. friends helping me and friends of friends helping me and people I've admired and people I don't even know. Like, well, sure, let me talk to your cousin about being an artist. Like, I can only do that so many times. <laughs> yeah. But, like, it's the same thing. Like, if we're not giving back with our community and all of that, yeah. like, we're failing what we're doing. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, like, like I remember even just like the, I got a good one, a, a, a great full circle story. This guy, um, this kid, when I was doing Civ, came up, he was 15 years old, Warped Tour, and he was like, can you sign my record, take a picture with me? So I was like, yeah. <clears throat> and supposedly, I sat down and talked to him. He was a musician and a guitar player. And I told him, keep doing your thing if you love it. Like, don't worry about other shit. I gave him some kind of pep talk, which I know at the time I must have been in a fantastic mood because most of the time in Civ, I was always in like a fucking pissed off mood. I was either married or getting divorced or, you know, just living a quite a celibate lifestyle on tour. And straight edge just taking everything in the fucking face. And the fucking band was called Civ was like so annoying. So if it was like a success, it was the band's. If it was a failure, it was mine. All this shit. So <clears throat> I was a little nuts at the time. So fast forward, my oldest kid, Bella, she, she's like, I, she becomes obsessed with um, my chemical romance. And I'm just like, yeah, I know those dudes make a black a parade or some shit. Yeah, cool. So I should actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch up she to they. So they come home from work, and old habits, dad habits. They come home from school. I'm making dinner, and they're looking at me, big eyes, and they're like, six, I think it's like 15, 16. And Bella says, Frank Iero follows you on Instagram. And I'm like, who the fuck is Frank Iero? He's a guitar player for My Chemical Romance. So I'm like, oh, I'm cool again. I'm cool? Like, this is cool, right? I'm not like a dumb dad. So I contact Frank and I say, hey man, you don't know me, um, but my kid is obsessed. I can't have them go in a hot topic and buy like a shirt. Like, if you got anything you can send me, I'll send you, because he's like a tattoo guy. I was like, I'll send you some hardcore shit back, whatever. Writes me back like the nicest thing. And he tells me that when I was 15, you sat down with me and told me to pursue music and keep playing guitar and all this stuff. And um, it meant everything to me. And you know, I'm like, sick, look at you doing My Chemical Romance. Not gonna take credit for that, but at least I said something nice and gave back and talked to somebody the way you know, Jimmy from Murphy's Law would talk to me. <clears throat> and Frank sent me this huge box, endless shit for my kid. And then we wound up going with his kids and his family, axe throwing at like a, a weird renaissance fair. So hardcore, like just it all comes back. Made you a cool dad. Made me, very short time. Yeah. I was cool for a minute. Okay. And then by the time axe throwing, it was like, all right, dad, too much. I don't. I don't want to know. I don't want to know Frank this well. I just wanted the shirt to go to the show. <laughs> I wanted to, yeah. And I had another. I just had another cool dad moment with Taylor Swift. I was able to, with some help from uh, other hardcore luminaries, get my kid into Taylor Swift in uh, Jersey. So that was pretty sick. My eight year old. How was it uh, reliving or re like reminiscing on on these things while you were uh, writing the book? It was great. Uh, I don't ever try to look back in like a, uh, I never get like boohoo, oh, I wish it was those days again. In my head, I don't know what's wrong with my brain, but in my head, I'm like, shit, I haven't even peaked yet. Like, better things are coming. We're going to yeah. do cooler stuff. Like, let's, let's just keep going, you know? And that's who we were, and that made us who we are now, and that's cool. I mean, sometimes I, I you know, my, my wife would read stuff, and she's like, I don't know how you guys are alive. 
And I'm like, these ain't even the bad stories. Like, these are like, this was like when it was kind of fun, you know? But like, there's definitely times, you know, one time we were driving in Europe, 92, our second tour, and one of the guys in the band, it was like kind of a scab lineup of Gorilla Biscuits, <clears throat> pissed off the driver so bad that the driver got up. It was one of these vans you could stand up in. Got up while he was driving in the right lane and just started fist fighting in the middle of the van. And we drove like Dukes of Hazard style, like off the freeway, and landed in like this pile of rocks. Like it was just like what the f like. Oh, shit. It was it was like a movie where like you're screaming, everyone's screaming like John Candy style, and then we just crashed and we were okay and we started dying laughing and like you know ran out of the van throwing rocks around. But it was like we meant the mental torture. That's why I should actually maybe get on this. Um, podcast about mental <clears throat> disorders and uh, like uh, mental health because you you could crack a man so bad that he gets out of the driver's seat to fight you that's high level that's was high it level you ball he was breaking. Fighting? no it was Tom Capone from uh, Future Quicksand and from Beyond so when does the uh, when does the book come out uh, it drops it drops that's what the kids say it's dropping in September, we're thinking mid September will be out hard copied and out into the um, into the posts, and we'll have them. We should have them. We're playing, it, oh, I think it'd probably be earlier. So I'm gonna say early because we're playing two shows at the Monarch. Um, Grill Biscuits is playing two shows in Brooklyn at the Monarch on the 7th and 8th of September, and we're gonna do a book signing on the 10th. So I'm saying mid to be safe, but we're planning on having them by the 10th and do a book signing. We're going to do it um, at Generation Records. I haven't announced it yet, but we're going to do it at Generation Records on Thompson Street. And everybody but Ray Cap will be there from the, from the tour. So I think that'll be fun to catch up with the dudes, get yelled at for shit talking them in the book, <clears throat> see how that goes. And then. Um, Have any of them read the book? No. I've only given snippets to Mike. And uh, RJ and Richie a little bit, but Ray and Priscilla have not read it. No one's read the whole thing. Do you think any of them? Uh, Richie will probably read it. No one else. I, Richie will read it, and and Mike will Mike might read it. Karen, his wife will read it. RJ might read it. Uh, Walter will probably get to it at some point. Um, and Ray and Priscilla, I hope they read it, but I'm not sure they're busy. They'll skim. You know, it's kind of like what I would do, skim to skim to the parts where I see my name and go, what would they say about me? <laughs> but, um... Who's going to be the toughest critic of all of them? I think, I think, um... Mike is, Mike is going to be sensitive about it. Because Mike's, uh, Mike's sensitive in a, in a loving, wonderful way. Um, Walter might be a tough critic or judge you about it. Um, I think Richie will be supportive and Purcell will probably be like, I didn't fucking do that or I didn't fucking say that and I didn't do this. And uh, a lot of it is, a lot of it was cheerleading. Uh, I was, you know, I was a fan of everybody. So everybody comes off pretty great, I think, uh, overall because I was such a fan of them as people and as performers. So no, there's no, uh, no real beefs. I hope we can do something in LA before the end of the year. I would love to. I if it has anything to do where we can do like cool vibes and cool stuff like you did with that BC Boys thing, I would love to hype this uh, book up, but also just hype up this time um, in history and youth of today. And it was the glory the glory days of it was. I think by the time we got to California, like we kind of talked about it before. Like Roger brought up, like when you're when you're traveling across the United States and you're from New York there was a momentum building every time we played but it was this like underground network of phone calls and holy shit next town next town next town and by the time we got to California man they were a well-oiled machine and it was powerful and it wasn't like we're playing with the exploited it's like we're gonna fucking crush the exploited we're gonna destroy the exploited no one's even gonna talk about the exploited after we get off stage and that's that's the mentality we still have sometimes when we get put in a weird slot, you know, and Walter will just be like, they're never going to want to play after us again. Like, let's just try to burn this fucking thing down and just give the best show you can. Leave it on the stage, you know? Yeah. I have a question for you, though. <clears throat> the 
Do, was your magazine in the early 90s while you were sleeping? It was. Did you interview me for ta a tattoo thing in that? Because I think I did that. Was that you or somebody it else? It probably was not me. It was not you? I doubt it. Okay, because when that came out, I was like, this motherfucker. <laughs> they, I could look back and see who it was. They, you know what, like, it, it was actually, it's actually good, it was a positive thing in the end because I was on the phone in my kitchen, like, cooking, doing this, and I'd get asked questions. It was about, like, I'm hardcore and tattooing or whatever I was, in, I was doing, probably the same shit I'm doing now. But I was like, dude, I don't know, dude, like, I don't know, maybe, dude, I don't know. Like, I was answering shit like that, and they fucking wrote every dude. Wow. There was no editing. Oh, shit. I read that shit, and I was like, you were, the, stu stuff. Yeah, you were the stupidest person I've ever heard do an interview. It was so <laughs> fucking embarrassing, and I feel like they threw in a couple extra dudes. We probably did. Oh. Sorry. Dude, it was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dude. It's okay, dude. It made it made me laugh, but I was like, "Oh, I'm a fucking idiot." But it made me um, maybe better at doing interviews because I tried to not say "dude" so much. Maybe <laughs> I have to look back at my archive when I get home and see who did that. I hope it was you. I'll be like, "You motherfucker!" I hope it was. I don't think it was though. I don't Fine, remember. I remember talking. I was on a pink, old pink like '70s film with a giant cord, like a yellow kitchen on Thompson Street, like a fifth floor walk up. I sent in a picture of like my dog in front of my face like I was MQ or some shit like hiding my face and the dog. I just ran into MQ in, in uh, LA. Or Maybe I shouldn't say where he is. It wasn't LA. He's all over. Allegedly. Could be anywhere. But yeah, I saw him in uh, California. It was the most MQ shit ever. I walk out of the, me and Toby walk out of the um, backstage door to go, I don't even know, go to the Winnebago or dinner or something. And he's standing there on like one of those like motorized scooters. And he's just like, Siv. And like the sun's behind him, so I kind of can't see him. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, yo, it's MQ. And I was like, what? I said, oh my God, what the fuck? He's like, yo, perfect timing. And we hung out for like 10, 15 minutes and then he vanished again. Sounds like him. He's the best. He gave me a bunch of stickers. He was fucking. Sounds like him. He's, yeah, he's, he's, he's a fucking shadow. How's his how's his uh, art career and graph career? He's doing it. Still, He's still, still doing painting, it. still killing it. Killing it, right? Yeah, I know. I see it. I still, I follow him, and I'm just like, I just want him to the best. Yeah, he's great. But um, I'm excited for this book to come out. Uh, thank you. And thank you for you know doing this. Thank you for making this happen, and for you guys working on the book together as well, and putting your story out there. Thank you. And aside from the book, just you know everything you've done in your life path and the way that you've presented your art, uh, I really do appreciate that, so thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having me, it was great. 100%. And I'm glad thank it again. all happened at the time when it was supposed to happen. And thank you for meeting Thank you for letting me take over some of your questions. For sure. Yeah, all right. Peace. Good, good job, guys. <laughs>